This video is part one of how closed loop spinal cord stimulation works. It follows on from the video how spinal cord stimulation works, where we explain that spinal cord stimulation works by activating large diameter mechanoreceptors in the dorsal columns of the spinal cord. Activation of these fibers causes a subsequent activation of inhibitory interneurons in the spinal dorsal horn, which in turn suppress the activation of nociceptive projection neurons and the transmission of pain signals to the brain. ECAP controlled closed loop spinal cord stimulation is designed to capitalize on this mechanism of action. In order to best understand how this works, we need to first talk about action potentials. The action potential is a propagating wave of depolarization down the cell membrane of a neuron. Without going into too much detail, it is worth recapping the voltage changes that accompany the action potential. If we imagine a single axon from the dorsal column fiber like such, voltage is a measure of potential difference which means it compares two voltages on either side of the divide. In the neuron's case, this divide is a cell membrane. In its resting state, the inside of the neuron, or its intracellular potential, is negative 70 millivolts. At the initiation of the action potential, sodium channels open and sodium ions rush into the cell increasing the intracellular potential. This flips the voltage inside the cell from negative to positive. This is called depolarization. Next, potassium channels open to allow potassium ions to move out of the cell on their own concentration gradient. This is known as repolarization. And at this time, the sodium channels also close. As potassium moves out, the intracellular potential becomes more negative again, overshooting the original baseline, known as hyperpolarization, before potassium channels close and the ion pumps work to restore the resting membrane potential. The evoke spinal cord stimulation system can detect voltage changes in the spinal cord from an epidurally placed lead which means it is detecting extracellular potentials from outside the cell. As such, the shape of the signal recorded will look like a mirror image of that measured intracellularly. Although this is a bit simplified, the N1 peak is the extracellular counterpart of the main peak of the intracellular action potential correlating with the influx of sodium ions into the cell. While the P2 peak illustrates repolarization and hyperpolarization, the overshoot, corresponding to the outflow of potassium ions. In practice, however, spinal cord stimulation activates multiple fibers of different diameters, thereby triggering several action potentials from the dorsal column neurons creating a compound action potential, the sum of all generated action potentials. As this compound action potential has been purposely elicited or evoked by some external source, it is called an evoked compound action potential, or ECAP for short. The size of the ECAP is typically calculated using the difference between the N1 and P2 peak. In case you forgot, the action potential is an all or nothing response, meaning a neuron does not fire a larger or smaller action potential depending on the stimulus. Therefore, the ECAP amplitude is indicative of the relative number of fibers that have been activated in the spinal cord. As the lead is quite a long way from the activated fibers on a cellular scale, the size of the recorded response is small and measured in microvolts, one microvolt being one millionth of a volt. Whereas the stimulus applied to generate these ECAPs is in the order of volts, which is six orders of magnitude larger, just fractions of a second before the recording. 
To put the difficulty of being able to achieve such a recording into perspective, that is like you trying to listen to this video while Formula 1 cars race past you. The Evoke Closed Loop Spinal Cord Stimulation System is able to measure ECAPs in either direction as they pass beneath the contacts on the epidurally placed lead, propagating away from the stimulus. If we look at the spinal cord in cross section, with a spinal cord stimulation electrode in the epidural space, we can imagine the activating electric field that is generated by the implanted stimulator around a specific spinal cord stimulation contact. If strong enough, it will penetrate the dura mater, cerebrospinal fluid, and activate a particular volume of fibers in the dorsal columns. These activated fibers will in turn elicit an ECAP the system is able to record from another contact on the same epidural lead. In this example, a 5 milliamp stimulus has generated a 10 microvolt ECAP. In the same patient and situation, a stronger stimulus of say 15 milliamps will activate more dorsal column fibers and therefore elicit a larger ECAP. 50 microvolts in this example. At the end of the How Spinal Cord Stimulation Works video, we concluded that a certain volume of dorsal column fibers need to be activated in order to create the desired analgesic effect. We also mentioned that this will be different for each patient and with different etiologies. Furthermore, the current amplitude required to activate the spinal cord differs from patient to patient, as does the range of current that results in discomfort or unwanted side effects. This defines a usage range where the lower and upper boundaries need to be determined for each patient. This can be achieved by measuring an activation plot with ECAP amplitude plotted against stimulus amplitude, where the patient reports when they first become aware of the stimulation, referred to as the perception threshold, up until the moment the stimulation becomes uncomfortable, referred to as a maximum tolerable. In this example, 3 milliamp and 4 milliamp stimuli generate no ECAP and no sensation. However, as the stimulation is increased, the patient reports some sensation at 5 milliamps. The ECAP is detected and the ECAP amplitude increases linearly until 15 milliamps, where the patient notes the stimulation becomes uncomfortable. We can label our measured upper and lower bounds. The range within these bounds comprises what we call the therapeutic window. For optimal pain relief, each patient should have stimulation that results in spinal cord activation that remains within the therapeutic window. This window is different for each and every patient. The therapeutic window is a very important concept in spinal cord stimulation. In the next video, we will explain how the Evoke Closed Loop Spinal Cord Stimulation System uses ECAP measurements to maintain therapy within this therapeutic range, and why this is difficult to do without closed loop control.